It was the 1960s, and everyone was interested in self-discovery, cross-disciplinary education, and making love, not war. In this environment, old theories were explained in new terms, often by adding a social dimension. One such effort at Yale found anthropologist John Dollard and psychologist Neil Miller joining forces. They tried to explain Freud's psychoanalytic theory in terms of drive reduction. Drives are strong stimuli that produce discomfort, hunger, thirst, etc. A drive impels us to action when we encounter a cue. According to this view, you're already hungry, drive, when you hear your tummy growl, cue. The cue triggers a behavior designed to reduce the drive, you get up and go to the kitchen. If you are successful in reducing the drive, you find a bag of cookies, the reduction in drive reinforces the sequence, making it more likely to happen the next time you're hungry and hear your tummy growl. If you don't find any food, the next time your tummy growls, you'll try something else, yelling for someone to bring you food, calling for takeout, or going to the store. According to this view, only behaviors that result in drive reduction are likely to reoccur. Primary reinforcers are events that reduce primary drives. Food reduces the physiological drive of hunger. Secondary reinforcers are events that reduce learned drives, acquired drives. But the two kinds of drives aren't interchangeable. That's why eating a cookie doesn't make you feel better about being lonely. Cookies can reduce the primary drive of hunger, but not the secondary drive to feel loved. The whole process combines four steps. Drive, cue, response, and reinforcement. Drive is the engine. The cue tells you when, where, and how to respond. Your response is any behavior or sequence of behaviors you perform, and the reinforcement is the consequence of drive being reduced. If your behavior isn't reinforced, that behavior will be extinguished, disappear. But the process doesn't stop there. You keep trying different responses until one of them satisfies the drive. Like most drive theories, Dollar and Miller don't explain where the drives come from, they assume they are given. Since Dollar and Miller used rats in mazes to test their theory, the best way to understand their ideas is to pretend you are in a maze. Having run this maze before, you quickly head toward the food, but discover that the path you usually take has been blocked. This is Dollar and Miller's definition of frustration, a blocked attempt to reduce drive. As a rat, you scratch the floor, try to climb the maze, bite at the blockage, and rush around in an agitated state. As a human, you do pretty much the same thing when your goals are blocked. If you lock your keys in the car, you stomp the ground, yell at the car, and pound on its windows. All because your goal is blocked. Frustration can also come from being unable to do two things at once. When the frustration is severe, Dollar and Miller call it a conflict. Freud says conflicts are unconscious processes. Dollar and Miller see conflict as incompatible responses. There are four types of conflicts. Approach approach is the choice between two things you like. If you put a mouse in the center of a straight maze with food at each end, it goes to whichever goal is closer. People do the same thing. They choose grocery stores, banks, and gas stations this way. Assuming they are about equal value, you choose on the basis of convenience, that is, immediacy of drive reduction. In approach avoidance, you're at one end of a straight maze, no turns. At the other end is both food and electric shock. An experienced mouse runs toward the food, but slows down as it gets closer to the food shock combination. Conflict is wanting your food and wanting to avoid the shock, two incompatible responses. Let me put it in cognitive terms. This is completely undollar to Miller, but it will help you remember it. You're in a straight maze. From where you are, the food looks pretty good, so you head toward it. But as you get closer to the target, you remember, having been there before, about the shock. The more you think about the shock, the slower you run toward the food. In Dollar Miller terms, the tendency to head toward the food is an approach gradient. The closer you get to the goal, the more exciting it is. But the closer you get to something you dread, the more you dread it. This is the avoidance gradient. People love approach gradients. Anticipating going to a big event, looking forward to your birthday, or thinking ahead to a new car. All these are approach gradients. Remember how excited you were when you got your driver's license? The closer you got to that day, the more excited you were. People underestimate the value of an approach gradient. Children in particular love anticipation. 
If you want to get your kids excited, don't surprise them by taking them to Disneyland. About two weeks before the day, tell them you're going to take them. And then every day when they ask, is this the day? Say, no, but it will be soon. Is this the day? No, but it will be soon. And when the day actually comes, they will be super excited. The same is true for adults. Adults don't really like surprise parties either. Surprise parties are the most fun for those putting on the surprise. Most recipients look confused and startled more than happy and pleased. We look forward to vacation. We look forward to holidays. We love to anticipate events. It's the approach gradient in us. We also dread visiting relatives, attending meetings, and going to the dentist. And the closer we get to negative events, the worse they look. That's our built-in avoidance gradient. One of Dollar Miller's key principles is that avoidance gradients are steeper than approach gradients. We might say that when we're happy to have a date, but afraid we'll get stuck with a loser, we're in an approach avoidance conflict. Blind dates don't sound too bad from a distance, but the closer we get to the day of the event, the worse it seems. Why did I ever agree to do this? As long as the avoidance is small compared to the approach, something irritating but not overwhelming, we perform the behavior. But when the avoidance exceeds the approach, we opt out of the situation. We take back the clothes we can't afford. We try to get out of the car lease we signed the day before. When avoidance is greater than approach, we call off the wedding. Avoidance avoidance conflicts occur when we're stuck between two things we don't want. Given a choice between a toothache and a dentist stabbing you with a needle, we try to do neither. When given a choice between two political candidates, neither of whom you like, many people choose not to vote. They hover in indecision or opt for none of the above. Conflicts don't have to be simple either. In double approach avoidance conflicts, it is the choice between two ends of a maze, each with its own approach avoidance conflict. For a mouse, this would be food and shock at one end of the maze, and food and shock at the other end too. The mouse begins running toward one end, but it slows down as it gets closer. Then it turns and runs toward the other end, where it slows down and turns and runs back. The mouse spends most of its time running back and forth in the maze, never getting shocked, but never reducing its hunger. The human version is similar. It's the choice between going home for Thanksgiving to be with your dysfunctional family and staying where you are but being lonely.